I'm going to be checking. You'll see me glancing at my computer once in a while because I have a blog post that goes with this too. So if you haven't checked out the homeschool think tank website yet, definitely check that out. And if you go to the blog, you will find the article. All right. So today we are talking about road schooling and homeschooling. And I'm going to start by explaining a little bit about what road schooling it is. And if you are a family who likes to travel, you might be road schooling if you aren't already a family. And if you're homeschooling and you love to travel, you have fewer obstacles <laughs> to overcome. So I want to help you discover how you can connect, learn, and have fun while road schooling. Now, let's start with the basics. Let's start with the definition. Usually when I share a definition, I am sharing from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. That's generally where I go to. And this time when I searched for the word road schooling, here's what I found. The word you've entered isn't in the dictionary. Click on a spelling suggestion below or try again using the search bar above. So they told me it's not even a word. Um, so then I tried, you know, most people when they say road schooling, it's brought together. So it's not road and schooling. The word is one word. So then I tried just two separate words, got the same response. So I have created my own definition for you. It is a word. I am not the first person to use this word. It is a common word in homeschooling circles. So here is how I have defined the word homeschooling. Let me look for how I defined it. <laughs> okay. Well, basically, I can't find it in my post. Road schooling is traveling while you educate your children. That's the bottom line. But I was going to read the exact definition that I wrote, but that's okay. So, and you know, I think before the COVID pandemic of 2020, a lot of people didn't even realize that homeschooling was an option for them. They, if you didn't know somebody who homeschooled already, or you didn't grow up as a homeschool student, then you might not have even known that was an option. Now the whole world knows homeschooling is an option, at least where it's legal. It is not legal in every single country, but it is legal in all of the states in the United States, although every state has their own laws. So with that, I think, I wonder how many people ever think about road schooling. Now I am not a road schooling, homeschooling parent, we almost were, and I have to say that is one of my biggest regrets is not following through with actually becoming a road schooling family. And I'll tell you a little bit about that journey, because even though we didn't do it, there was a journey as we explored it. Listen to the Homeschool Think Tank Parenting Podcast yet? Check the link that I've shared and, or go to homeschoolthinktank.com and learn how you can listen to the podcast. If you're a podcast listener, you're, you're going to want to tune in. We're pushing a hundred episodes now. It's pretty exciting. All right. So with that being said about what road schooling is, it's basically traveling while educating your children. Let's talk about where road schoolers live. Generally speaking, I believe that most people who are road schooling live in a fifth wheel or a motor home. Now, if you don't know what a fifth wheel is, that is basically a camper trailer that you tow behind your truck. And there are two types. We've had a few of them over the years, so I can explain this. One is a gooseneck, and that neck goes down into the bed of a truck. It's much easier to drive and take corners with a gooseneck. The other one is a tongue pole trailer where it hit, it goes onto your bumper. So if you have an SUV and a smaller trailer, then you can do a tongue pole. And then of course there is your motor home, which that can come in a lot of different styles. You might have a camper van, especially if you're a smaller family and you're really adventurous, that might be something you want to do. Um, 
You could have a smaller motor home. You could have a really large motor home. So there are a lot of different options. Now, years ago, quite, I mean, this is probably 10 years ago now, my family and I were going to become a road schooling family. My husband had the opportunity to take a position where he could travel a lot. And since we homeschooled, I was like, well, why not? Let's go with him. And we were never going to be a family that was traveling like every single week. It's like, let's go to this area and stay here for a while for two or three months and explore that area and then go to another area because the position he was applying for, and I think he had a decent chance of getting if he would have pursued it, would have opened up his territory for him here to California and Alaska. And we live in the Southwest. So that would have been a pretty, pretty large area. And it would have been really exciting. So here are some of the obstacles that I went through. And I'll share this with you a little bit. As we explored this, we actually did buy a fifth wheel. And for most of our marriage, we've had a camper of some sort. So we were pretty familiar with all of that. And my husband can tow a trailer with no problem. So for us, the fifth wheel was a, a good option. We actually bought a huge fifth wheel. When we towed this thing home, we were as long as a semi truck. So I think it, if I recall correctly, it was 45 feet long, a gooseneck, obviously, and it had five slide outs. So with a, if you're not familiar with campers, in my world, people are pretty familiar with this, but not everybody is. So a slide out is a portion of the camper that comes out and that extends the living area off to the side. So it had five slide outs, one 14 foot, two seven foot and two six foot slide outs. If I recall, this was actually, it was a huge fifth wheel, two bedrooms, a bathroom. We even had a washer and dryer, dryer in it. We were going to do it. So as we really were exploring this, it was really exciting, but there were all these things in my head that I was like, how am I going to deal with this? Um, one of the first things was we have stuff. So literally overnight, I went through our house one, well, not overnight, but one day, let's say it was a Friday. I went through my house and I quickly pulled out everything out of the house that I was like, we can live without that. And it was just a no brainer, quick, quick, quick. And the next day we had a yard. So we lived in a great yard sale location at the time. Now we live in the country and having a yard sale is not worth my time. So we out, sold a ton of stuff, donated almost everything else to Goodwill. If something really had more value, maybe we held it for the next one or sold it on Craigslist. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't even think Marketplace was a thing at the time on Facebook. So that's, that's what we did. So I believe that if you want to travel and you start getting serious about it, learning about minimalism is one of the first things <laughs> you need to do because you've got to get rid of stuff. You cannot take a whole household with you if you're going to live small. Um, so that's, that's just a little, one of the obstacles for me and we had, we owned our home, so we had to sell the home. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll come back to this in a little bit and go a little bit deeper into the story, but let's get back to the step-by-step -step about road schooling. So I've explained to you what it is. It's traveling what, or educating your children while you travel. What we're talking about right now is where road schoolers live. So fifth wheels and motorhomes are pretty common places for a road schooler to live. Now you could also... <laughs> If you really wanted to, I guess you could do it out of a tent. That wouldn't be for me. I can tell you that for sure. I'm, a tent's fine for a night or two, but not a way to live. Um, but people do this. I have an aunt and uncle that did this one summer. They just did it for like three months. They were teachers. So they, they stopped, they sold their house or if they were renting, they quit renting, they ended the lease and did it over the summer and they were moving to a different area and then they then they had a home again. So it was a temporary thing. It was a two or three month thing, which I think is a great way to try on road schooling. And it was good weather season. So 
that's that's something they did for a short time. I would say they were road schooling at that time, and they certainly educated their children a lot over that summer in non-traditional ways. So even though their kids went to public school, but you could do it out of a tent. Um, I recently interviewed Sarah R. Moore. She's the founder of Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting. And she's also a world schooling mom. So we'll talk about world schooling in a moment. But they rent Airbnbs around the world as they travel. So I wouldn't call them road schoolers. I would call them world schoolers because for them, they are crossing oceans. Now, I do know there are people who will fly to another country, you know, cross an ocean and then get an RV and road school from there. But if you're really leaving your country, I would say you're more of a world schooler. Now, that to me is the biggest difference between road schooling and world schooling. World schooling, you are crossing bodies of water at times to get to your destination. Road schooling, I could leave my house today and stay on roads to get to the next destination. All right. You might wonder if, you, if road schooling is a new idea to you and you've just never even thought of this for your family, you might be sort of thinking in the back of your mind, isn't this like homelessness? And no, it's not. If you, if you are road schooling as a homeschooling parent, this is done with a lot of intention. It is not a small decision to make, and it can take months of planning to get to do the thing you want to do because you are like you likely have a home right so you are going to have to end a lease or sell a home or rent your home you're going to have to get your affairs in order to become a road schooling family it doesn't just happen overnight now you can try it on with fair ease i mean anytime you leave your home there's you've got to things left behind that you have to take care of, right? So um, so that's, I just want to distinguish that. No, it's not homelessness. This takes planning and you have the option. You can always say, this isn't for me and go rent a house or an Airbnb, or <laughs> even if the Airbnb was road schooling and you were traveling well, if you decide you want to stay put, you can do that while you look for something else. So it's not necessarily a permanent thing. I, when we were considering road schooling years ago, oh, we were at a hot springs, one of my favorite places. And I met a lady there that was so neat and she really inspired me. And she was really like sort of this catalyst for, yes, let's do this. And we did move forward after visiting with this lady a lot. So she and her family started out as road schooling for like a year and they ended up doing it for 17 years. Now, let me tell you a little bit about her story. I wish I could reach her today, but I don't know. I wouldn't even know how to reach her. She, she and her husband decided to put their belongings in storage because if you're going to road school, you have to think about what am I going to do with my stuff? What am I, are you selling it, donating it? Just leaving your house and just going and, you know, having somebody come in and take care of your home. What are you doing? Well, for them, they decided that they were going to store their things because they thought it was only for a year. <laughs> they loved it so much. They never went back to their storage. They paid on that storage unit for 17 years, literally, until they ended their road schooling journey. And then they went back to the storage unit. She said, we didn't want any of it. We didn't, we didn't even know what was in there anymore. We didn't want, she said, everything was outdated. You know, so basically the only things you might want are your photos, which in this day and age, put them on your computer. You don't have to keep big boxes. And then if you do have boxes and albums, leave them with a family member who has a, a house. That's my take on that. So that is one of those concerns that you have to do and go through. 
is what to do with your stuff if you want to become a road schooling parent. Um, I really think as homeschoolers, we are in a really unique position. We are not tied to a public school or a private school calendar or a geographical location unless the way you make your income is tied to a geographical location. But one of the, I suppose, upsides of the COVID pandemic is that for many people, for the first time in their life, they have the opportunity to work remotely. My husband's been working remotely for over a decade now. I work remotely with this. I don't have to be in any specific place. And so a lot of people are having geographical freedom right now. And a lot of kids are doing online learning and so many more parents are homeschool, truly homeschooling their kids, not just doing distance learning, but even if you're distance learning, if your kid doesn't have to show up every day, you can do this. And I know there are some people who think you should just absolutely stay put during the COVID pandemic. I tend to think I have to go do things from here. Sometimes I can do that somewhere else. And, you know, you can do it. There's a lot of things you can do without getting too close to people. If that's your preference, there's a lot of hiking trails. There's a lot of things that you can do that aren't with people. So that that's my take on that, but to each their own. So I believe, and this is at Homeschool Think Tank, we have the slogan, live and learn your way. And I genuinely believe that we need to value each other's opinions and that understand that everybody isn't going to do things the same way. So for some people, they're like, yeah, I would do that. Other people are like, no, I'm staying right in my, my home spot. But we all have our, we can make our own decisions about what is best for us and our families. So, okay. So I'm going to give you a specific example here of how road schooling can look. Now, first of all, there are many styles of schooling, of homeschooling per se. I don't personally love the word homeschooling, but that's what people call it. So that's why I called homeschool think tank, homeschool think tank. Um, I know that some people follow a school at home model, even if they are legally homeschooling their children, right? So they might follow a school at home model. Other people are unschoolers and other people are radical unschoolers. Other people do child-led learning. Other people are game schoolers where they learn a lot through games or subscribe to more of a wild schooling philosophy. There are so many ways for children to learn and it is not a one size fits all thing. So let's talk about road schooling. You could integrate any of those styles into road schooling. You can follow a school at home model. You can be an unschooler. You can do game schooling while road schooling. Road schooling is an enhancement in my opinion of any style of homeschooling, if traveling will work for your family, if you have reasons you shouldn't or can't travel, then that is not an enhancement. You wouldn't want to do that. But okay, so I'm going to use something that I'm a little bit familiar with. A road schooling family can read about, say, the ancestral Pueblo people of Mesa Verde in. Colorado. You can read about that in a textbook. You can look at pictures of these amazing cliff dwellings online. But when you're road schooling, now, if you live close to the thing, you can go do it, right? Anytime, whatever the thing may be, whether it's Mesa Verde or something else. But when you're road schooling, you can also go to the destination and experience it. I believe that road schooling is about experiencing what you're learning, not just reading about it. So you can then go and do the thing. 
you can go and experience it. You get out for the day with your family. There's a lot of connecting that goes on around that. Um, and that's how that is. So I gotta, I gotta pause here. Oh, and then you can also visit the museums. You could learn from a national park ranger. Your kids might even want to join a junior ranger program. And you know, they, these kids, they take oaths to parks, continue to learn about national parks of America and to share their own ranger story with friends and family. Now, just like I'm sharing this with you, a kid could do this with, uh, you know, on your own personal pro, uh, Facebook profile or Instagram profile where you're sharing with your personal friends and family and they can learn how to do terror and go live because video is a real world thing in today's society. Social media is a real world thing and they can learn how to share these things. They can also do it at a local homeschool events where the kids get up and speak about their experiences with different things they've done. And when you are a road schooling family, there are ways to connect with other people who are also traveling. You can do these things with others, or you could even reach out to local homeschooling groups and see if you can find somebody to do this with you. And you can also make friends. So, and then after an experience like that, you can, you can scrapbook it. Kids can really use their handwriting in a scrapbook if you keep a small one with you while you travel, <laughs> but you can also do it digitally. You can use Photoshop and different things. So your kids are learning about technology and writing about it. There are a lot of different things that can go with any specific field trip per se. And you can repeat this process over and over everywhere you go. So that's, that is a little bit about road schooling. Now, let's talk about how road schooling kids make friends because friends are important. And I believe that having a community around you is one of the best ways to continue homeschooling for the long haul, even if you're road schooling. So I first want to tell you that I have an entire blog post about how homeschooled kids make friends. So if you go to the homeschool think tank website slash blog, you'll find it in there, or you can put in this search bar friends, it'll pop up. Um, and so there's that, and all of the ideas in that article are relevant here. But in addition to all of the ideas there, you can search Facebook for groups, for traveling groups. You could do travel groups, RV groups, homeschool traveling groups, all sorts of things like that. But in my research, I'm always researching things. I found a great website called Full-Time Families. It is all about full-time <laughs> RVing, traveling families. You might want to check that out. I have a link to that in the blog post. And then I would love to invite you to join our homeschool parenting group on Facebook because you can connect with other families in there. I know we do have a couple of road schooling families in there. I would love to have more. And I would love to invite you if you are a road schooling family to apply to be a guest on our podcast, because I would love to share some of your stories. And I have a link to that in the blog post that goes with this. Now you can also learn about more about our private online community by going to the blog post that goes with this. So, and the URL for this particular episode is homeschoolthinktank.com slash road schooling dash and dash homeschooling. So it's homeschoolthinktank.com road schooling and homeschooling. All right. I'm going to give you a few ideas of things that you could do as a road schooling family. And just so you know, a lot of these things have reciprocity. So let's say if you get a one-year pass at a science museum, ask them if they have reciprocity with other 
science museums, because you might buy that pass once and be able to use it all over the world. In fact, not just the United States, but the world and get into other museums for the cost of that one time. The same thing is said with zoos, aquariums, botanical gardens. Oh, even like if you ski, you can get reciprocity passes with skiing, all sorts of things have reciprocity passes. So anytime you're going to buy an annual pass anywhere, ask if they have reciprocity with other similar organizations. So national parks, they have a national parks park pass that lets you in anywhere. State parks. Now, if you get a pass to a state park, sometimes in state for national parks, I think national parks, not totally positive, but I know with some state parks for sure, you can actually get discounted rates at, for your, your overnight sleeping you know, so if you tend to stay in state parks a lot, that can be a great, a great benefit. Children's museums, nature centers, botanical gardens, science museums, historical landmarks and museums, art museums, wilderness areas, national forest programs, hiking trails, libraries, recreation centers, local attractions and landmarks. These are all things that you can do just throughout the world. Now, um, if you, let's say you're worried about getting stir crazy, living in, in small quarters while you rode school and you just need out, here are some other ideas that you can do. If just sort of, just get your mind thinking about this. Clearly you can do all the things we just mentioned above, but you can go to the park. You can find rock climbing gyms. You can find other local, wherever you are at that time, homeschooling organizations. You can go bowling. You can take your kids swimming, play basketball on an outdoor court. There's indoor courts too, right? Play tennis, look for a family-friendly gym, go hiking, go geocaching, ride bikes, take a walk, go to a coffee shop, go to the library. One of my favorite libraries it's funny I have two my libraries are favorite in two different ways I have two libraries that I love but one of them has a coffee bar and like a whole like community gathering area before you even enter the library and outdoor seating areas and it's a great place to meet people really um so these are things that you can do now you might be wondering about your educational materials and where are you going to put all that stuff when you're traveling and going all the time? So first of all, remember, there's a lot of different ways to educate your children. You can use base, your classical textbooks if that's what you want to use. You can also use real world experiences. You can also use libraries anywhere you go. You can utilize something like Khan Academy, you know, which is an online free resource. I think most people are aware of it now, but that's K-H-A-N Academy. Um, there are a lot of resources available. Now, when you're traveling, you might not always have online services. Your kids can read books. They can write in diaries. You can literally take a book and your children can you know, copy out of a book to practice handwriting, handwriting, and they learn a lot of grammar that way too, by copying out of well-written books. So keep in mind, there are a lot of ways for kids to be educated. It doesn't need to look like it does in a public school classroom. You don't have those same confinements. Now you do need to consider the laws where you live, but that's, that's something we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so before you decide if road schooling is for you, you know, this is not a decision to be taken lightly. I think it's a good idea to take a few practice runs living the way that you think you would want to live as a schooling family. You know, so if 
you're picturing yourself in a camper, borrow one from somebody, rent one, buy a used one, used, <laughs> because then you can sell it if you need to. If you go out and buy a brand new one, good luck. I don't know. This market's really weird. Things are selling in a weird way right now with uh, all that's going on in the world. But yeah, I suggest used for those things so that if you don't like it, you can turn around and sell it. Um, so I think practice runs are a good idea, but then there are a lot of things to consider. You know, if you have children, how old are your kids? How will you keep them safe while traveling? This was actually one of my big obstacles. My kids were fairly young still when we were considering road schooling. I now really wish we would have done it, but I did have some real world obstacles that hung me up a bit. One of them was I like knowing who is around me and I like feeling like I'm safe and that my children are safe. And I was having a hard time with the thought of, okay, I'm going to be doing the dishes, but the girls, my husband's still going to be working and not always home. Um, you know, home even in a fifth wheel because he has clients to go see in various places and sometimes out of town. How am I going to keep my children safe if they want to go outside and play at the time, you know, I had a nice big backyard and they could just go play. I didn't have to worry about that so much. And yes, you keep an eye on them, but they are fenced in and others are fenced out. Right. <laughs> so, so keeping your kids safe is a real world thing. If you have a child who has disabilities, how are they going to handle that? Is this going to be good in that situation or bad? I actually believe it could go either way, depending on your situation. One time years and years ago, before my husband and I had kids, we met a couple while we were kayaking and we were at a state park and my husband during the time there befriended this man. And we went over and visited this other couple and they had an adult daughter who was severely disabled who was on life support really with them. And I, I really, I was taken aback. I didn't really know what to think of that or what to expect, but from where I sit now, I actually believe that was probably a great way for them to live because they didn't have a big house to maintain. They didn't have a yard to maintain. They could give all of their attention to their daughter and each other, you know, and I don't, I can't say that she was on life support, but she was not even able to walk. I don't believe, or I don't know that she would, it was almost like she was in a coma, but it was, but not quite, <laughs> but she, she was not able to do a lot, but her parents were able to very well care for her. And some people might've looked at that and thought, well, why are they doing that? But I can see that now. And we've had enough, enough fifth wheels and spent enough time in fifth wheels and campers that I recognize fully how much more time I have when I'm living in that manner. You know, even if it's just for a week, because I don't have all the other household things and you know, even laundry in some ways is easier because everybody just goes and does it at a laundromat and then you come back and you're done. You know, it's not like a daily thing. It's a weekly thing or every three or four days. So it, like I said, it's each person needs to look at their own situation. Um, homeschooling laws, how will you comply with your state's laws? And we are going to talk about laws just a little bit more here shortly. Actually, you know what? I'm going to take a moment and do that now, and then we'll come, come back and talk about the other things. Um, so at Homeschool Think Tank, I'm not a lawyer. We're not lawyers. We do not dispense legal advice. I want to be very clear about that, but I'll help you get started on the right foot. I believe that when you want legal advice, the best place to go is Homeschool Legal Defense Association. That's the go-to place, in my opinion. Um, so 
here is what HSLDA says. You should follow the law of the state in which you are physically present. Basically, you could be under their jurisdiction at that time. So, and this is especially true if you are going to reside in a state for more than a month. So as a result of this recommendation, I believe that if you are a road schooling family, you might want to consider not staying in any one state more than 30 days, especially while school is in session. Um, if you live outside of the United States or will be traveling outside of the United States, you definitely need to know the laws. And um, you can check a map that I've linked to in the article that goes with this podcast episode. So each country, each state has very different laws around homeschooling and HSLDA has a great map that has divided the states into four categories. And these categories include no notice required states, low regulation states, moderate regulation and high regulation states. Pretty popular states for families who are travel, traveling, who are road schooling to live in, so to speak, are Oklahoma and Texas. Those are some of the more friendly states for homeschoolers, but there are others as well. But it's, I think people do that not based only on homeschooling laws, but say taxes and other things as well. So, and I've listed all of these in the article that goes with this episode. Um, now, if you need to move <laughs> so that you are living in a state per se, <laughs> you know, I say that with quotes, living, that is easier for homeschool families to comply with their regulations, you might need to change your legal address. And I, from my research, I would suggest using a service that we have linked to in the article that goes with this episode. I'm not going to name it here because if at some point I change it, I want it to be the same or I want it to be updated. But from what I've researched so far, this is who I would recommend. And so check the article if you want to see that. And, but they can do mail forwarding and all sorts of things like that, which I did so much homework when we were doing this a decade ago. The services and the groups that are out there now are so much better than when we were going to do it. So, all right. So there we go. We've covered the laws. You need to know they're different. There are some places that are easier to homeschool from than others. Okay. Now let's go back to other things that you might want to consider. Clearly finances. How will you pay for your expenses while you're traveling? How will you care for your pets? That's another one. Pets. That was a huge deal for us because we had a dog and a couple of cats and my daughter, I mean, oh, speaking of the dogs, you might hear them barking right now. Um, yeah, taking care of pets was a problem. So your home, if you own a house, what will you do with it? Sell it or rent it? And your stuff, what are you going to do with that? Sell it, donate it, store it. And then I know there's so many more things and you're probably thinking of them. So if this is something that sounds appealing to you, I would encourage you right now while it's on your mind to write it down, write down any of those obstacles that are coming to mind, because I do believe you can overcome most of them. And I actually believe that for me, we could have overcome those obstacles when we were thinking about it, but I let my own mind get in the way. Okay, so I think I mentioned this earlier, but I think if you want to road school, you really need to consider minimalism <laughs> and you need to learn about it. And I have a whole article written about minim minimalism and resources that you might like. So again, check this article to get a link to that. Um, and that's at homeschoolthinktank.com slash road schooling and homeschooling. Okay. Pros and cons of road schooling. So some of the potential disadvantages, and I want to say this before I get starting, what could be an advantage disadvantage for one person it could actually be an advantage for another person. Depends on who you are. Um, but 
Okay, I think this is a disadvantage for most people. Lack of a stable community. However, if you travel with other homeschooling families or you meet others and end up traveling with them, you then have a community that is stable, but you're just in different geographical locations as you travel. So I know of certain industries where people travel. Actually, when we sold that fifth wheel years ago, go people that bought it um, ran big carnivals, actually. I know of another family who is in the movie industry. They are really considering homeschooling their children. They have toddlers right now, and they have a community that tends to live in fifth wheels a lot. So it sort of makes sense for them. Um, another disadvantage, some kids might have a difficult time with the uncertainty of where they will be next. Maybe a potentially small space to live in is just more than you can bear. <laughs> There's such a thing as too much time together. So I think that's a huge advantage is having time together, but sometimes <laughs> you can have too much time. Um, you need to limit and limit the items that you own. This could be a disadvantage. I personally think it's a bit of an advantage because the less you have, the less you have to do. Um, you have a small space to cook in. This was a huge disadvantage in my mind. One bathroom. That's a pretty big disadvantage for most of us. And most fifth wheels only have one bathroom. Um, pets can be difficult. Traveling, packing up to travel is a real pain <laughs> in the rear. I don't particularly like packing up days. Um, advantages to road schooling your family. Freedom, freedom, freedom freedom, freedom, which is a lot of why I like homeschooling, freedom to explore. You get to see new experience or get to experience new things, see new sites, educational opportunities. There is so much to learn and see in this world. And when you're road schooling, that just opens up in a big way for you. Um, time with your immediate family. So with your spouse and kids, you can have a lot more time together, but that too much can be a drawback. So I think it's important to find a balance somehow. Um, I think time to see extended family or friends, because when you travel, you might be able to do that a little bit more. Uh, no yard work. That is a big advantage in my book. But if you love gardening, that could be a disadvantage. Less home maintenance. <laughs> As my husband and I thought about living out of a fifth wheel years and years ago, that was a big deal. We were like, see you major big box department store. Yeah, that wasn't the truth because we didn't end up doing it. But a lot less home maintenance, a lot less money going out on home maintenance. So with that, a potentially low cost of living. However, road schooling could go either way. You can make it really expensive. You can also do it on the cheap. Totally your call on how you go about that. Um, I believe that making new friends is fairly easy for road schooling families. And because there are some communities that exist around that. And I have seen it happening in various ways over all my lifetime of camping a lot and just meeting people. And I think one of the biggest disadvantages, excuse me, one of the biggest advantages is spending time with your children and spouse. So I think if you're ready for some amazing adventures, if this sounds appealing to you, if you can figure out a way to pay the bills while not being stuck in one location, maybe you ought to explore it, but it might not be for you. But what this could have done is just made you go, you know what? We could do that for a month every year. We could do that for a couple of weeks every year. So there are other ways to go about this. Um, so that's it. Now I want to invite you, if you are a road schooling family, I would love to hear your story, hear what you love about it, what you don't, and share it through the Homeschool Think Tank podcast and through Homeschool Think Tank in general. So, and again, if you haven't joined our homeschool parenting group yet. I would like to invite you to do that. Finally, in the article that goes along with this episode, I have included some books about road schooling that you can get on Amazon. And 
that's it. So you all have a great week. I will chat with you next week. Bye-bye. And live and learn your way. And again, the URL for this is homeschoolthinktank.com slash roadschooling and homeschooling.